I think I, okay, now can you hear me? I, okay, good. I forgot to turn my, uh, my mic on. I am, uh, I've, I've started up Skype if you want to call in as well. All right. Are you ever just going to say, hey, Martin, are you there? Is it going to be Ridgeville all the way up to the last week? It's going to be Ridgeville all the way up to the last week. Pardon me? But, but he's not in Houston. He's in Ridgeville. Um, I try to keep it easy on myself, and, and uh, uh, tomorrow morning when I come in, if I were to take your strategy, tomorrow morning when I came in, I would say, Martin, are you there? And the guys would like give me a blank look and all that, where, as it will always be Ridgeville, you know, so. So you're worried about getting confused from one class to the next? I am worried about getting confused from one class to the next, absolutely. Yeah, something like that. All right. We left. I love to get away from these deep conversations. Okay, I come to class to learn, not be part of more deep. Wow. All right. Where we left off last time was we were looking at putting the clear button to be sensitive to the radio buttons and to only delete the selected ones. And I came up with a solution, and um, student made a point, rightly so that it involved redrawing the whole GUI. And depending on, on the volume of data, that could either be trivial or that could be a big thing. So the statement was made that it would be better, instead of what I did, clearing out everything and then recreating the GUI based on the shared preferences, instead, as I was deleting it out of the shared preferences, to delete it out of the GUI at the same time. And it's a case of one of it's a, one of those cases where once I sat down and thought about it for a second, um, it is as simple as going through the list backwards. All right. In other words, you don't start your loop counter at at zero and go up to the length of the number of elements. You start at the l number of elements minus one, and you loop through until you hit zero. And then you evaluate the last one, and then either you delete it or not. The next to last one, next to last one, next to last one. All right. Let's say you have 10 things in your list, 0 through 9. You look at the item at index 9. All right. Regardless of whether you delete it or not, the next one you want to look at is the item at index 8. Regardless if you delete that one or not, the next item you want to look at is at index 7. So, again, it was one of those things that after I sat down, thought at it, it was like, oh, it's not that bad. So let's look at the code here. Clear buttons. Oh, my, my dog when I was growing up was named Buttons. So I just heard clear buttons. It's like, aw. All right. Here I'm doing essentially the same thing. And I think I pasted this code up in Angel in an announcement. But, oh, thank you. I have my shared preferences as I had before. I grabbed the number of, uh, that, that are in here originally. All right. So, However many are, are in my shared preferences and GUI as I start here. I start at that minus one, all right? Because again, if there's 10 children, they are, um, they are element um, zero through nine. So if there's 10 children, I start at n minus one, whatever it is minus one. So I start at uh, I start uh, at one less than the number of children. I do this as long as i is greater than or equal to zero. So I'm looping backwards, and instead of incrementing i, I decrement i. So I subtract one from i. Other than that, I do the same thing as I did in the code above with. The following addition, if, I, if the checkbox has been checked, in addition to removing it from the shared preferences, what I've done before, 
I remove that view from the table. So I get rid of the table row. All right. So I loop through the rows of the table backwards, do the same thing I did before, grab the checkbox, see if the checkbox is checked. If it's checked, grab the tag from the button, delete it from the shared preferences, and then I remove the row from the table layout. And then when I'm all done, I apply that. So this is probably a better solution because it doesn't involve deleting, resetting, and redrawing. It accomplishes everything in sort of one pass. So that was a good suggestion to, to examine it this way. Questions on this? Yes. 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 Yeah, that's a good question, and and um, th this is sort of key to the the this example and your assignment is that at this point, notice I am looking not within the whole table. I'm looking just at that row, and just at that row, there's only one button that has that as a tag. So uh, I'm sorry, that has that as the ID. So yes, in the table there's a bunch of there's a bunch of buttons that have that ID. And that would be a good question about what it would return if I said find that. You know, it, it might give me an error or it might return an array or whatever. I don't know, a collection. But um, in this case, um, I'm only looking at the one row at a time. So as I loop through. I grab the next child, so I'm grabbing the next table row in turn. In this case, I'm starting at the bottom and going up, but next child only contains one table row. So when I look for the button or I look for the checkbox, I'm looking for it within that table row. So I say next child find view by ID. I don't say query table layout. I am curious what would happen if I did that. Well, this is just for laughs. Go and do this. My guess is my guess is I will either get an error or I'll get the first one. Or null. Or null or yeah. My guess is that I don't really have any idea what's going to happen. I'm going to guess they'll give me the first one. Let, let's see. We know bottom line is it's not a good idea. All right, because it's going to find a couple things on there. So let's go in here and let's select the top two and I'll click clear. Am I sure? Erase. It ended up getting rid of all of them. <laughs> which I don't know what that means. Whereas if I do it legit, if I do it, if I change this back, so I would, I would have to analyze, um, or we can, do, we can do a Google. I'm not really sure why it did that. But this code does work. I want to prove that to you. So that there's no doubt. If I go in and put I put three of them in and indicate I only want to get rid of the middle one.
It only got rid of the middle one, B. All right, so that code works. When I, when I changed that, when I made that mistake, it gave me all of them. Let's do a quick Google and see what that says. Uh, what is a function name that I want? Find view by ID. Duplicate ID. Because I'm kind of curious myself exactly what I did. Can someone tell me what would be the outcome of the using find view by ID when multiple child views have the same ID? Blah, 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 blah. According to this, random chance <laughs> as to which one you get? I don't know if I believe that. Okay, <laughs> the next person says, no, that's not true. It's not random at all. Find view ID is a depth first search algorithm. It will return the first view of the specified ID it will, it will find. And don't send this guy private questions because he doesn't have the time. <laughs> yeah, right. And then this guy says, I said random, but I really didn't mean random. It wasn't intended early. Uh, literally, and if there's any more comments, things are going to rapidly degenerate from here if my experience on the internet is, is, is at all true. Uh, somehow someone will be blasting someone's political views and, and you know, all kinds of things. Yes, yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, it, it'll be in there. So, all right. So at any rate, the bottom line is you probably don't want to do that, right? You probably want to make sure you're limiting the scope if you're using the find view by ID to point to just the one thing. So you want to make sure, like in this case, don't do it on the table, do it on the row, because the row is going to be unique. Whereas the table, we're going to have one occurrence of those for, for each. Are there questions? In fact, I'll bet you that's what it did. It found the first checkbox, so it used that as, as yes, it's checked, all the way going up, and that's why I deleted all of them. That'd be my guess as to what happened there. I'll bet you if I, if I I'll bet you, uh, well, yeah, let's do it. What the heck? Query table layout. And I changed this to say checkbox equals. If I say query table layout again, I'll bet you if I don't delete the first one, it won't delete any of them. So I go in here and I pick the, uh, the first one I say don't delete, the second one I say delete. I click clear selected tags, erase, did not erase any of them. I switch that and say the first one I want to delete, clear selected tag, erase both of them. So it grabbed that first one in doing it. Interesting. Yeah, so Could, it, so yeah, so Yeah, so in other words, when it evaluated the first row, it still used a check. When it evaluated the row, the last row, it still used the first row's checkbox. When it used the second row, it used the. So for every one of them, it was using the first one's checkbox. That's why it's either going to delete everything or not delete everything. All right. That's a moot point. We don't want to do that. <laughs> It is interesting to really understand, though. I think in one of his famous quotes, and I know that, that uh, for a while they had a Stuff Huffman Says Twitter account going, only I don't think it was called Stuff, but you get the idea. Um, one of the things he said is, is one of the classes, um, the aim is to remove the magic from it. In other words, things shouldn't happen that you look at and say, well, I have no clue why it did that. So it's nice to sort of perform these little mental exercises and do things so that that will give you an indication of truly understanding the way the code works. So that's why I was so curious about that. And that was, that was like, well, that's a good question. What if you do this or that or the other? So now we should be back in business here. And we should have the proper 
code to do that. I do want to apologize on grading of the stuff because the problem that I run into sometimes with grading is um, if people have, have developed using a different version of the SDK than me, I have to download stuff and I've been trying to do everything on one platform and I've been hoping that I can successfully take stuff that you did in Eclipse and grade it. I have on my desktop machine upstairs Android Studio. But so far that's been problematic. So I would have hoped to have stuff graded like by last Thursday because my aim is usually to have stuff graded by the due date. Uh, and I was working on it before I came to class today and I think I was close but no cigar. Yes. Exactly. And that's what I was going to say. One thing that you're welcome to do is if you want it graded quicker is stay after class and just show me and I'll, I'll look at the code and you can show me running it on your platform and, and we can view it that way. That way that will save me a little bit of grief. I'll give you feedback quicker. I know there's been a problem with the Dropbox and the size of it. Um, I did expand some of them so there it could not be a problem going forward but it still could be a problem. So if you are welcome to do that and just say hey I'll bring it in class and in that way um, I get saved a headache, you get saved a headache, and, and you get quicker feedback. So I encourage you. With a smaller class like this, it's kind of nice. It is kind of nice from, a, from an educator's viewpoint, too, is sometimes when you run into a problem, it's hard to describe it completely by writing a note. But if I can say, look, look at this line here, you know, when, you know and I can explain it better that way. So do consider that as an option as well. I have a nagging thought in the back of my head that there was something else I wanted to talk about. Toast. Thank you. All right. A nice little debugging tool is Toast. Now you still have in both Eclipse and I would imagine in Android Studio, yeah, you have a debugger that you could go in and set a breakpoint and you could debug. And I'm going to go in and put something in. Then I'm going to delete it. This kind of launches configure to open debugger. Okay. It has hit that line of code. Oh, it, or it's about to hit that line of code. I'm sorry. I click erase and I think this is could be slowing things down. Yeah, I, I'm hitting erase and absolutely nothing's happening. So this is having a trouble with debugging. So, what's your other option for debugging? One of the options for debugging is through the use of what's called Toast. All right. Toast is a, a little debugging class and it's very similar to running an alert in other languages. So if I type in Android Toast example, the debugger should have worked and again um, the bugginess of Eclipse is one thing that people aren't really big on and, and that could be maybe that is, is done um, better. Pardon me? Oh, a absolutely. Absolutely. So, let's see. Let me 
copy the code. And let me put it in here instead of the breakpoint. What I do? There we go. Here's a more succinct example. All right. So now, as I run this, I go in here and I'll put a couple of items in here. Since I put that in the loop, each iteration through the loop, it will show me the toast. It's called toast because it pops up briefly and then disappears, which is a lot like how toast works in my house because it pops up out of the toaster and shortly, shortly after that it's gone because I eat it. That's, yeah, okay. It just wasn't funny. I get it. All right. So I'll go here and I'll click this guy and I click there, click there. Notice there, this is an Android message and it actually appeared twice, once for each iterate. Oh, there's the second time it appeared. All right. So it just pops up a little message. So that's a nice quick and dirty way that you can go and pop up a little message um, to do that. Again, the debugger allows a systematic way of doing that, but we saw a case where the debugger was problematic. I'm really not sure why it was giving me grief in that particular case. Um, okay. Um, student reported that there's not an issue with the Android uh, Studios de debugger, whereas I just experienced one with Eclipse, and possibly I did something wrong and just haven't noticed, but you're encouraged to try that. But Toast is a nice, quick, and dirty way to do that as well. All right? And it's also a way if you want to put a message in there. Like a lot of times you'll see, like uh, in my email application, it'll say email sent, message sent, or whatever. And it doesn't do something as clunky like an alert that actually, alert dialog that pops up that you have to click OK. It just pops it up and it disappears shortly after. So that's another good debugging tool. One thing that I encourage um, students in all my classes is to take sort of a systematic approach to all these things. In other words, don't simply thrash and try a bunch of things and, you know, try a, a more systematic approach in debugging. Next thing we're going to look at is we're going to test your geography skills and we're going to run a flag quiz game. <coughs> I don't know if it's geography or not, but it's identifying flags. Are there any questions about what we've covered so far that we want to review?
All right. Let's look at the flag quiz. This is another deal example. Yep. And let me go and run it. All right. All right, here we go. Guess the country. Notice this. I turn it, doesn't do anything. That's one thing to notice right off. All right, what country is that? Is that Belarus, Japan, or Vietnam? I'm going to go with Belarus. Shook its head and said no. All right, the flag went sideways. And you see that in a lot of apps with passwords these days. If you get your password wrong, it, it shakes at you. All right? I know it's not Japan, so it must be Vietnam. And it shook its head, yes. And then it goes on to the next one. That one, that is Sweden. Yes. This one is Saudi Arabia. And so on. All right. Now... Remember, the focus always is on, on new stuff about this application. Well, we've already seen one new thing about this application, is that we have a little, little animation based on whether the answer is correct or whether the answer is incorrect. And there's several ways that you can do animation within Android, and this is one of them. We'll see the technique that we use here. The other thing that is new here is we have a menu might be a little hard to read the details, but when I click the menu button, I can select the number of choices. All right? In other words, I can make it so that it gives us three, six, or nine choices. So I can click select number of choices and choose between three, six, or nine. Notice that this is a modal window. Can't do anything behind it until we made our choice. So I pick six. And now we have six options. By the way, if I change any of the parameters, it restarts the quiz, just as an FYI. The other thing I can do is I can click this, is I can limit to regions. And there's a series of checkboxes for the different regions of the world that I can pick or not pick if I didn't, excuse me, if I didn't want them. So if I only wanted to test the Western Hemisphere, I could say North America and South America. And then all my questions will be based on the countries of North and South America. So we have a menu and we have an animation. All right. Um, let's look at the code and let's see what other new things that we have. I'm just going to roll through this. It goes until you get 10 of them right. All right. Yeah, that's okay. I can see them and it's not helping. Yeah, really. Yeah. That's Mexico. I know that one. And that is Honduras, I think. No. Ecuador. Or Antigua. Oh, it is Honduras. I clicked the wrong button. And this one is... And it gives me, tells me how many guesses it took and the percentage. I'm not sure I like it coded that way. I think it should just tell you you're right or wrong and then give you a percentage based on that. But 
it, it goes for, for all that. And then when you're done, you can reset the quiz and play it again. Reset your settings. No. So in other words, number of choices is still six. And select regions is still just the Western Hemisphere. All right. I have a question about Go ahead. Activities. activities, yes. So whenever I start up Android Studio on a new project, it does select an activity. Okay. And one of the first apps I tried to build for one of our homework, I just sort of blank activity. Uh huh. Could not get it to build. Okay. I kept complaining about it. I didn't have an activity. So I had to scrap the whole thing and start over and choose one that was blank activity but had something in it or something. Okay. Or no, I chose no activity, then I chose blank activity. And I think okay. So I've been choosing blank activity. Every app I've built since then? Yes. So I'm just wondering, I know there was one activity I think before that had like the menu thing already built into it. Yes. I don't remember which one I did. It was like that's pretty used for this one. Um, and you haven't really gone over the activities yet, so I didn't know if we're going to be talking about those at some point or how we know which activity we're supposed to pick. Well, keep in mind that um, if you do this, you know, if you do this in Eclipse, you go File, New, and you're going to say an Android application project. That will do effectively what you said as create it with a blank activity. Okay. So in other words, think of an activity as in essence a screen that they're going to see and go and do their stuff. All right. Um, if you're going to go to something else, it probably will be like, for example, in the Twitter search we went in there that launched another activity. Can I click this? Okay. Blank. Okay, I stand corrected. Full screen activity and a master detail flow. But you know, I and the the Android Studio does a little differently. Mm -hmm. More activities to choose from, but one of them is no activity. But like when I tried to run it, it kept giving me issues about an activity being missing or not being there, not able to resolve one, and I didn't know how to add an activity retroactively. Well, you, you would go in and, and essentially you would recreate this code here. You would create your class that extends activity. I tried that. Okay. And I couldn't get it to work. So I didn't, you know, I, I mean, I'm guessing that there's reasons why you would have an app that doesn't have an activity as opposed to one that where you have an activity. Right. I just haven't explored anything yet as to why. I'm not really sure why you would, would have an, an app that didn't have an activity in there. Unless it's giving you is giving you the ability to just create it with a blank slate so that you can do whatever you want and not make any assumptions. Mm -hmm. Still think it would, would run within the context of an activity. Let's Google it. Android Studio. No activity. No activity. I just installed and tried the code, but there's uh, blah 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 blah. That doesn't look good. Add a second activity. Ah, if you're making a service. Uh, okay. that makes sense. Yeah, if you're making an uh, an Android service as opposed to that. Okay. All right. So I think we do, we're going to have. We're going to we're going to have activities for all of them. Yeah. Thank you. Good good question. All right, let's look at the code and let's see if we can find the new stuff here. And again, we'll go through and sort of do like we did before, look at use cases 
and see the stuff that we see. Let's see, source. All right, we still have our single activity. Assets. We have a bunch of folders, a folder for each of our options, all right? So it, it knows where to pick from if we said that we only want North America or whatever. And within each of these, it has, uses this sort of naming convention of the name of the region, a dash, and then the name of the nation. And then any spaces within the nation's name um, contain underscores. Just as any spaces within the region have an underscore. So there's a dash that separates the region from the country and um, any internal spaces are implemented via an underscore. Now, why do they follow this naming convention? Because the, the files that are there are what tell it like what country it is. So the naming convention is important here. This doesn't run off of a database. It has a, a, a table of countries and a table of image names that belong to it. The data for this of what country is what and what country has what flag is actually baked into the name of the file. So that's why they have to follow this naming convention. All right. And there's again multiple folders and those will be used when we decide what countries we want based on the regions. All right. Under resources we have a new folder. A-N-I-M for animation. Now as I mentioned before, this is a way, this is one way to do animations within Android. There are other ways that we can do it as well. But this is one way. This animation lives in an XML file. And if you look, we have two different animations. We have a correct shake animation and we have an incorrect shake. So the correct shake nods up and down. The incorrect shake nods side to side. Here's an interesting thing. There are cultures where just the opposite is true. All right? I forget where one of my coworkers was from, but he would he he drove the one boss crazy because it asked a question and he'd shake his head, meaning yes, you know, and for a while it was confusing until they realized that there was this miscommunication. All right? So this is something you definitely could put in a, re, uh, um, a user resource qualifier to say if you're somewhere where head shaking means something different, you could do a different sort of animation. All right? So again, just a thought. Let's look at what these consist of. These consist of essentially a series of translate commands. All right? And the translate command tells us how we're going to we're going to move a view. This first one says from y delta of zero. In other words, start, the starting point of this is the y-axis of zero. The y-axis being the vertical axis. Go to y delta negative point five, or negative five percent, I believe that says, p. So that's going down a little bit. Then we go, and it is going to take 100 milliseconds. So it's going to take a tenth of a second. And then we're going to start at our position, and we're going to go up to 5% P. So we're going to go a little bit higher than its location. It also is going to take 
a tenth of a, uh, a second or a hundred milliseconds. And the starting offset of this guy is 100 milliseconds. What does that mean? That means that this animation runs first and it goes for 100 milliseconds. This guy's offset is 100 seconds, so 100 milliseconds. So this guy will fire off right after that guy completes. And then finally, we do this one to go back down again and we start at 200 milliseconds. So after this one and this one is done, we um, uh, we we do this one. Yes. If you were to accidentally uh, have, let's say, 100 milliseconds on the last translate, would you get a compiler? You wouldn't get a compiler, but it probably wouldn't do anything because you'd tell it to move up and down at the same time. So I'm guessing it would just stay there. Okay. Um, you can use the same offset if you wanted to do, do things like, as it moves up, rotate. So. That's one transformation that we can have to, to um, move the, change the Y coordinates, to move it up and down. There's a whole bunch of other translations that we can do, including rotations. All right? Or, I'm sorry, not translations, but there's other aspects of animation. Now, as you might imagine, this incorrect shake works essentially the same way, except we're changing the X element. Here's a list of the things, that, or here's examples of some of the things we can do. We can change the alpha of this, uh, of a view. What would changing the alpha of the view do? It either faded in or faded out. All right, this gives an example of that. Here's a rotate one. Again, it's not translate. Translate relates to moving, but rotate, we can give a rotation and we can specify where it's going to start, where it's going to end, what the pivot point is. Do we want to rotate starting in the upper left-hand corner? Do we want to rotate around the center of it? And so on. Moving is the translate which we talked about. We can slide up, slide down. We can bounce. We can do sequentiations, which would simply be to do each one of these individual ones one after with the appropriate. If you don't you have things happening at the same time. To get one by one. So if I rotate, I'm going to rotate it as I make it bigger or smaller. So if I do, you for whatever animation to have and make it do something goofy. All right. So don't really explore. Make it bigger or small. Make it better. All right. So we have All right. Let's which are Which
is the Change that to 